When I go to the cinema or I watch television, I become manichaeist, I become cruel, I become uh, everything. That is the miracle of the, of, the, of the film. I become wire, peeping tom, everything. Philosopher, fashion photographer, comic book artist, and filmmaker, Barcelona-born José Ramón Larraz is a modern-day Renaissance man. In the 1970s, his Latin temperament brought a touch of continental fire to the staid British film industry. I first met José Larraz going for an interview to edit um, a film called Symptoms. The whole look and feel of the picture was, I thought, extraordinary. As soon as we met, we clicked, just like that. Uh, uh, he offered me the job within about two minutes, in fact. Symptoms was financed by a, uh, a Belgian publisher called Dupuy, whose uh, biggest claim to fame is that he had the rights of um, the little blue men. The, uh, they're called Strumpfs in France, and they were known as Smurfs. Much to our surprise, Symptoms was invited to Cannes uh, as the official British entry. I represent England what for me was a big piece, to represent a country like England, a country of fantastic filmmaker, me, with one film, small film, because Symptoms is a small film. My film is shown, uh, more or less uh, nobody liked it, uh, so may I go home. After working on Symptoms, Laraz and Smedley Aston decided to make a film together. The result was Vampires, released in 1974 a lurid tale of two hitchhiking lesbians who suck the blood of passing motorists. I think the idea to make a film together was probably mutual. As soon as the idea emerged, we both thought it was a terrific idea. So one day he told me, well, uh, I have not very much money for producing a film, but I want to take the risk with you. Over the years, several of my more respectable peers, school friends and people who'd gone into the city and were doing quite well, had said, if ever you need any finance, come to us. I was so naive, I sort of did a calculation on the back of a, an envelope within sort of five minutes of our conversation with Jose and said, we should be able to do it for 25,000 pounds. Within four weeks, we were into shooting. And by that time, I'd had no money at all. So I rang him up and said, well, what about this money? And he said, oh, frightfully sorry, old boy. It's a bit of a problem at the moment. So it meant a frantic visit to the bank manager at that time. And the old house went on the line. Brian Smedley Ashton was a perfect English gentleman. And there was Jose Larraz, who was tearing his hair out, swearing in Spanish. And, um, you know, it was, it, was, it, was, it was a comedy in itself. I always knew we'd find each other. By this sign, I'll recognize you. We were in long black cloaks and there were leaves flying about and we were very, very pale and mysterious and haunted looking. And everything was very dramatic. Things were black, they were very black. If they were Red, they were red. He was an artist, and he had this vision of how he wanted things to come across. When I saw the first cut of it, I thought it was very bloody. I didn't realize quite how horrific it was going to be. Maybe he told me put more blood because, well, it's more commercial. I hated blood. I don't like that scene. In vampires, about the sex, I agree. Why not? Blood, I think, was too much blood, really. What a bath of blood. It was gallons of, of blood. It's like, like an elephant. I don't know how many liters has an elephant of blood. It had to be bloodier. It had to be more violent. I think Jose loved the aspect of real horror. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 
special effects man. I remember his name was Colin. He loved blood. He, yes, loved blood. And I remember he worked with a kind of things I don't know. Similar to these things that you use when you have a plague on the, on the woods for kill the lobster, <laughs> like this, no? Yes, there was blood sprayed frequently. Plenty of blood. And when I say action, Jesus, he started with, with the hose, plenty of blood, and everybody was plenty of blood everywhere. And it was sprayed rather well, but not always very wisely. <laughs> we didn't realize quite how bloodthirsty it was going to appear on screen. Um, but it, um, it's really one of the most terrific, frightening scenes I've ever seen. <laughs> Jose has to take the credit for putting all the uh, sex and blood in vampires, but uh, I have to admit that I, I fully endorsed it. You know, he'd sort of come up and say, how about we put blood here and do this, and then the girls are going to be naked in this scene. And I said, yes, yes, great, great. <laughs> I was aware that the material was uh, much stronger than what was uh, normally seen, in, certainly in the X-rated cinema. When I looked at the script, there wasn't a great detail. It was just they made love or, you know, they had a shower. The sex was really up front. There was no apology for it. But it was quite explicit. I think that's what shocked me more than anything, the way it was put together. It, it, it was sort of almost like a breath of fresh air. It was there. <laughs> Brian told me, uh, now we go to watch the film with the sensor. Let's me to handle him. I said, well, OK. So <laughs> we saw the film, and I remember that Brian tried to keep her attention each time that he knew that come one very strong scene <laughs> to avoid that the sensor don't look too much <laughs> to the screen on this moment. We had quite a lot of problems with the sensor. Sex on its own is, was possibly considered all right. Violence in certain levels were acceptable, but the two together were considered too heady a cocktail. There are a writer, a Belgian, who his name, uh, his uh, Le Nom de Plume in French, you say, his name right writer, it's Thomas Owen. And from several stories of him, I was inspired for make symptoms, vampires, and all my, all my stuff come from Thomas Owen. <laughs> Thomas Owen had, a, I don't say an obsession, but a, a tendency to the vampire female in very different way than I put in my film. Uh, the vampire girls of Thomas Owen are always very sophisticated, uh, Marlendrie trick, you know? I put practical two cannibals or something like this. Two dangerous tigers. We were red-blooded women and we needed our meat and uh, there was no messing. There was no um, genteel approach to it. <laughs> he wanted it to be violent and um, colourful and exciting. And I think he wanted to excite the audience. What is surprising when you see the sort of the straightforward sex and violence of his work, um, you know, this man is a, is a doctor of philosophy. Are you interested in demonology? Only certain angles. I find all those things abominable. I don't reject anything out of hand. That attitude is more intelligent. Persons of importance are continuously making pacts with the devil. The films that I liked were the film with uh, mysterious, romantic mysterious, not guts and blood and vomiting monsters. No, that is not my kind of film. 
My favorite film is the spiral staircase. Jose is a, a unique individual, and that, that's what made films like Symptoms and Vampires so special. He has the intellect to draw upon um, rather obscure literary references, which might be lost on a lot of people. Uh, but also he has the sensibility of a, of a comic book artist uh, to, to sort of um, project it in terms of very strong visual images. Leraz studied philosophy and fine art. After leaving university, he went straight into the highly commercial world of comic book publishing. His favorite strips were exotic jungle adventures. And I started like this. I started with Tarzan, Flash Gordon, Jim Jungle, all the American comics, Mickey Mouse, these three little pigs. At that time, censorship in Spain was very strict, even for comic books, as Laraz discovered to his cost. I remember I sketched a close-up of a girl and imagine, was the mouth a little open, a little, the lips a little separate, not an ecstasy, not, not the eyes, no, no, just mouth a little bit open. Censor it. I said, but why? What happened with that? It is a close-up, not tits, it's a close-up. Ah, but she has the lips separated, and that is very uh, sensuous, too sensual. Tits, cut. Bottom, cut. Curves, cut. Sexy cat. Joseph von Stember in Brussels on the year 60, end of 68, in October, November. And I told him that I would like to make films. I was fed up to make photos and to make comics and to make, I would like to make films. But I never put my foot in one studio. I remember he told me, much better, much better. He was a very funny man. And uh, he told me, if you want to make films, the only thing you need is a camera, an actor, and make films. Do it, the film. You do one film how you could. And after the film by itself, somebody take care of the film. Was a very romantic view of film industry. But I more or less follow what he told me because my first film was almost finished and the film had not a trademark, had not a producer, nothing. Not certificate of origin, nationality, nothing was made like this. Doesn't matter where the film go, collect fantastic box office and the worst critics than you can imagine. Following Whirlpool, Laraz went on to direct more than 20 films. For several years, he specialized in violent thrillers and macabre mysteries. Then, in the late 1970s, he returned to Spain, where he became known for a series of crazy comedies. Occasionally, he was able to make more personal films, including, in 1977, El Miron, The Voyeur. Many of his films relied on a strong sexual content. Unfortunately for Laraz, most producers wanted a more straightforward approach to sex. But for somebody without context, without money, want to make a film, if not the unique, if not the only, the easier way was to make a film with a lot of sexuality in the film. Sex is something for my personal use, you know, you, you know what I mean. For me, I never in my life I went to a, see a film porno. I don't criticize who do. Everybody is own master to do. But for me, I am sitting in the chair watching. I, I feel like an idiot. Kiss her on the elevator. Oh, ah, oh, ah. Against the fridge. Oh. Against the wall. Oh, ah. Against everything possible to to screw in somebody, cut a crack. Sometimes if I don't see what happened and I am on the kitchen, I don't know if it is a sang scene or if it is a murder. Could be both. Or somebody strangled a girl or somebody screwing a girl. Because, oh, oh, I say, well, what happened? What, it, it, it's a normal man, it's not a, it's not a rhinoceros. No? 
Larraz's unconventional attitude to sex on screen has led to many strange and memorable movie moments, often inspired by his knowledge of art history and his fascination with ancient legends and classical mythology. That comes from one very old Greek gravure that make a horse. And inside the horse, it's a girl naked. And another stallion making love, copulation with the horse, but it's supposed that with the girl. I don't know if that is possible in the real life, or it is a girl very, very large. Well, was the time of Emmanuel? producer in Spain, he wanted to make a sexy film. And I told him, we, in Spain, we have something that could produce an Emmanuel beautiful. It's the flamenco world. You see a gypsy naked dancing on the moonlight, things like that. The, the, the horse, the sierra, the mountains, the all these things, no? <gasps> I told to the boy, you know that you ride uh, naked on the horse. I said, yeah, no problem. The day we start shooting, 10 minutes after the start, the boy on the hospital. The horse stopped standing up, looking at me. I presume the horse thinks, who are that idiot that jump in my back? and we stopped shooting for two days. The only professional was the horse. Hot fantasies. I don't like it, vampire. Hot fantasies. I am not interested on the phenomena of the werewolf. Hot fantasies. Oh. Lycanthropy is not my strong point. Sabbatic things, witchcraft, that I am very interested in this. It's an uncanny for me more believable than the vampire. Because vampire maybe exist. Dracula, Vlad Tepes, the real Dracula, but it's very remote possibilities than that exist. Witchcraft exists, had existed, exists today. Witchcraft involves a lot of female sensibility, which for me it's uh, something impressed me very much, fascinating me. There's something the fascination on the witch and all the things of, of the ritual of witchcraft, it's, uh, and also the danger that that uh, involves. I have a sympathy for those people because they're kind of rebels, no? That's why if you analyze one black mass, it's the parody, it's the send-up of a mass. Satan, come to us. Satan, Satan come, come to, to us. us. This is a great moment. I don't think the coven was a question only sex, they pretend many. That is the commercial side for sex exploitation, films or stories. But I think it was a counter-religion protest to say, well, enough. Why we are, which, why we, why this, why this thing? Because the, the church, the power of the church was unbelievable, unbelievable. Was that, uh, you believe in God? No. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, I start to believe, eh? <gasps> Although Laraz has worked mostly in the world of low-budget exploitation movies, his unique touch and use of bizarre imagery has not gone unnoticed. We prepare a serial of interviews with young chaps, young people like you, uh, film writers, reviewers. 
And it's when I was surprised how everybody told me about vampires, about films like this. I said, ah, but they, oh, yes, a cult film told me one. I said, oh, it's a cool. When we made Vampires, it was uh, really uh, made as a sort of ex exploitation movie, quick in, quick out, and it would probably be buried. But um, I, I was very surprised that it had legs. And it does, because only last year, a censorship changes throughout the world. Uh, last year, I sold the picture to India. These films were made very much outside um, the establishment, uh, very much living on one's nerve ends because it was all private finance, which uh, we never knew we were going to get back. Um, but the main thing that comes to mind is that it was fun. We had such a good time making these pictures. When I tell the taps about this, they just won't believe it. An isolated house in the woods at the witching hour of midnight and a cellar full of this marvellous wine, and above all else, in the company of two very charming ladies. Ah. It's almost too good to be true. Nothing's too good to be true. When I started to make movies, I thought it was very different. I was quite naive. When von Steinberg told me, take actor and camera, I thought make films was to make films, just like this. <laughs> no, it's very different. One thing is to make films, another thing is the world of the film, of the cinema. And if you are not on that world, you don't make films, or you don't make good films or important films. Brianna, what are you doing? Here, give me that gun. I'll shoot him one day. I'll shoot him one day, believe me. That's where I will. Because in France, I was a comic book designer, and I was a comic book designer, that's all. As soon as I start making movies, I become a second-rate director, and uh, even if sometimes I say myself, so what? Nah, but, well, I would like to make better things than I did. I think with Jose, it, it, to some extent, it is the sort of uh, the lonely artist in the wilderness. Um, he, he is very gregarious, he likes people, but there is a side to him that is very introvert. I mean, he often told me that he would quite like to be a monk and live on a mountaintop. So it's a bad profession for me. That's why comic book or the signage is good for me, because I am alone. I have my, my sheet of paper, my pencil, my, my pen, and my ink. And doesn't matter who I am, how I am, I make my sketches, my comics. I go to the publisher, he pay me goodbye. That's my perfect profession. Cut. Finish, no? Well, I became cast because the actress who was, he wanted originally wasn't able to do it, who was a wonderful actress called Jean Seberg. And in those days, equity was a very powerful union, and you couldn't work in this country unless you were a member of equity, and you had to go through a whole provisional period where I spent a lot of time in the theatre, in repertory theatre beforehand. And so she, because she wasn't a member of equity, she wasn't allowed to do it, which I didn't discover any of this till much later. And um, he therefore saw various actresses for auditioning, and I was one of them. And that, that's how I, I got the role. I, w I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't be sitting here otherwise. <laughs> At that time, I was just very nervous and very inexperienced, very nervous. So I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't formulate impressions of a person in the way that I would now. And certainly with no clarity, I would just think, he seems to be reasonably nice and it sounds like a very interesting role and 
it might be quite exciting because he's he's Spanish and he's a European director and they they approached camera work in a very different way from the English at that time. I mean, it, I was I was besotted with European film anyway, so that would have led me to be wanting to be involved. There was stripping in it and I refused. I was incredibly innocent in those days and refused point blank to strip in anything. Um, I did another thing, one of the wives of Henry VIII and refused to strip in that as well. And he was very angry about this so there's a little stripping moment in it which is not me and anyone who knows me would know that couldn't possibly be my tits. <laughs> if only they were. Because <laughs> I'm such a tiny little creature. Dictatorial directors, which Jose Larraz was, just um, informs you to what you should be doing and if you try to break away, will get, uh, he particularly, will get very verbally aggressive. So I mean, that doesn't, you know, denote that he's, he had no gift or talent. He had a remarkable talent, you know, remarkable. He had a wonderful eye. But I, I seem to remember we, we didn't always agree because <laughs> I have very clear images as well, you know. And he would he would give a note that I would, well, that I was thinking of anyway. I was thinking, oh, that would be interesting if she would this or she would that, and the note would come and it would be exactly what I was thinking. Jose had this incredible need to control all the time, and for example, I had to be drenched and wet from the rain, and. Uh, he, without, again, without me knowing always, um, had a fire hose put on to me, which was freezing. And uh, the power of it was phenomenal, knocking me over and freezing me. I had to be put in eider downs and blankets and God knows what. <sighs> he seemed to need to do these things. Cora, who plays this sort of phantom figure, if, I'm, if my memory serves me correctly, she was the director's girlfriend. One of his, you know, one of his many control moments was to give her a, a behaviour pattern with me without telling me. I would think that I was having a scene which opened with her arriving, putting her arms around me and just clasping me. And the next thing I'd feel her tongue in my ear. Oh, he was in one of his um, control, I rule the world moods. And I had a stand-in, a lovely stand-in. And um, the hours, of, I was on set almost every day, all the time, and you could get up at four in the morning and not be back till 11 at night. So I, any moment I had off was absolutely essential for me to rest before I was back on set again. And he decided one day that I wasn't to do that, that I was to be my own stand-in. So my stand-in wasn't called. And that was one of the diary reading episodes. And they were setting up the whole shot around me, which would be unheard of today, couldn't happen today at all. And one of the main lights landed on my head, fell from on my head, and the next thing I was in hospital. Um, and uh, they must have all been terrified, but we didn't do litigation in those, those days. And I thought, how kind of them, they've put me in this wonderful private room with fruit and flowers, it was full of bouquets of flowers having no idea that they were actually shit terrified. So I was going to sue them, which I wouldn't have even thought about, because you didn't. You didn't think like that. And, had to, and my brain had to be scanned, obviously, and everything. And the reason I survived it, which was actually was a miracle, is because I have, you may notice, a completely round head. I have an absolutely round head. So the brain surgeon explained to me. I'd never really thought of it before. <laughs> and it had, like a ball, it had hit and bounced off. It's amazing what you control out of yourself. You know, we forget all the emotions we went through as children and this, that and the other. And I just think if you're highly imaginative, which most people are, there's so much material when you think of the brain, the amount of material that must be there. And if you're receptive to it, you just, it just comes. I think you need to feel from the beginning of the film that my character is, well, if you haven't classified her as schizophrenic, that there definitely is something very powerfully dark. 
I think as a viewer you need to feel torn between two things, thinking, but she seems so pure and so she couldn't possibly do anything terrible. But on the other hand, you have to think, something's going to happen. I don't know what, but something's going to happen. I mean, actors, many actors seem to feel that you have to experience everything. You don't. You just have to convey to an audience that you are. If the audience believe you got it right, is all I can say. I got on incredibly well with the rest of the cast. Lorna Heilbronn, who I think is superb in the film, um, is a very good friend, very close friend of mine. So we worked beautifully together, I think. I mean, there was never a problem. And um, Peter, is, well, he's my surrogate dad. He was my dad's best friend. And they communicated, as far as I can remember, entirely in cricket terms either physically or verbally. And Peter, that, that's the only time I've worked with Peter on film. And it was fantastic, wonderful working with him. We made each other laugh all the time. There was a lot of corpsing that went on in that film, a great deal of giggling between us. I think everybody just was very committed to the film. For example, I provided my whole costume. Every single article of clothing that I wear within the film are my own clothes. In fact, uh, probably that was my complete wardrobe. Among my clothes, there's a big knitted brown cape. And my mum-in-law, my wonderful mum-in-law, knitted that for me. I am genuinely one of those people who don't see myself. And I, I hadn't seen it until I was sent it by the British Film Institute three days ago and watched it for the first time, which was most interesting to me. It's like looking at someone else. You, know, you, you don't feel you're looking at yourself, you, see, you feel you're looking at another person altogether. I thought it was beautifully shot and the whole piece is a very almost cold diamond English element it has about it. Of course it has an attitude to women but you'll find an attitude to women all over the place and an attitude to men today all over the place. I can't speak for my performance because I'm no good at that. You know, all I see is the things that don't work within my performance. So I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, yeah don't do that. But um, looking at the film as a whole, I could see that I was right. All my instincts about him as a director. And the, for the, the performances of Peter and Lorna were superb, I thought. Beautiful performances. I was very influenced by my sister, Vivian, who's, who was also an actress, who is also an actress, and uh, uh, she went to drama school in London, which seemed like a very good way of getting out of Glasgow, where I was born and lived until I was 18. And so I went to drama school in London. Uh, I got in, and that's how I started. And I think at school, it was one of the things that I was really good at. My parents were very supportive. Um, uh, my father was... Uh, a very um, artistic man and I was very, my sister Vivian was a very important influence on me, you know, she, I really, she loved the theatre in a passionate way. I think I was more um, in love with the idea of being an actress than actually the acting thing itself. But that came afterwards. I was very lucky because I worked with some wonderful directors at drama school who really helped me um, understand what it is to play a character and to open up a character. In those days, you got a call from your agent, and the agent says, "Are you? Can you go to so and so at four o'clock on Tuesday afternoon?" And you trundle along. You're given a very brief outline of what the thing is. You're never. It's never explained to you terribly well. And um, nowadays, if you, as an actor, you get some pages on on your computer, but that didn't happen then. You might get a little script in the post or something like that. But I don't remember that happening. In fact, I know I didn't see a script. I do remember um, meeting Jose for the first, t first time and what an intense uh, sense of intensity around him. I had a feeling that I was right for this part and of course I had just had my hair cut. You know, I had long hair like I do now 
And in those days, uh, to have short hair as a woman was quite a statement. And uh, I remember going along for the, the job and uh, Jose talking about when did I have my hair cut and why had I had it cut and things like that. And I sort of got a feeling right from the word go that I was going to get the job. Did, did you have a script? Were you, were you given a script? No. For, you just no, a I think he kept that very close to himself. I don't think he wanted us to read it. I mean, we've got the script, obviously, uh, before we started filming, but I wasn't given a script at the uh, audition. I did think, I, I mean, it's a long time ago, but I remember him talking about the, the film, the script, as, uh, as in a very kind of, what I suppose I would call now, a psychological way. He, 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 he was very, uh, I think psychologically, he was quite, quite well developed himself. And as I say, the word that comes up for me is intense. He was, you know, there was a huge amount of aliveness and dynamism around him. He was not a laid back person. As I think you probably know, <laughs> and um, he was charming and, and, and rather handsome. Mm. And I didn't find him scary at all. I know some people did. Um, I mean, he was very direct. You didn't. He was not one of those people who was um, polite. Really, he was very direct as a person. And some people like that, and I quite do. As I like to know where I am, and and he, you know he he didn't give a huge amount of direction. I, I I always appreciated that he kind of let you get on with it. If he didn't like something, he would say, but if if he you knew if he didn't say anything that you were on the right track, it was nice. I enjoyed that. I felt he trusted me. It's a kind of cliche, isn't it, that English directors can be quite sort of introverted. And um, Jose was not an introvert. <laughs> On the contrary, he was very extrovert. And um, that's what I'm saying, is that I always felt I knew where I was with him. With some directors that I've worked with, you're not quite sure whether they really like you or whether they think you're doing a good job at all. But I always felt that he did like me and thought I was right for the part. So I didn't feel that I got a huge amount of direction. And occasionally, you know, he would say something to me if he felt I was really on the wrong track. And, he, and I do remember he kept explaining to me that this wasn't theatre and that I had to do much less. What I think about the part in Symptoms was that I had to find that inner stillness, uh, which was quite hard for me to do. It wasn't natural. I mean, I had to learn that. And that's what Jose helped me with, I think. I had a feeling that he had a picture in his mind of what he felt it needed to look like. So I do remember uh, a lot of time being taken with lighting and props and settings and costumes and that kind of thing. He was very, very clear about what he wanted it to look like. I mean, I don't think much was left to chance on that. It was, I guess it was a fairly small crew, was it, really? By comparison? Very small, very small. Not that I had a huge amount to compare it with which is one of the reasons it was so good that Angela and I got on, you know, liked each other um, so much, which we, 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 we did, and we do, of course, as you know. Um, she's a good friend of mine and one of those people that uh, has stayed in my life, which is lovely, quite unusual. I mean, the scene that stands out for me, the one that I remember most, is the rowing scene. Do you remember, they get into the boat on the lake mm. And um, they didn't know that I could row, but actually one of the few th skills I learned as a child was because my father was a fished a lot. We, my sister and I and sisters and I were shoved into the boat and we were made to uh, row whilst my mother and he fished. So I actually was a really good rower. And um, I can remember in that sequence, they obviously had it set up to take the time that it was supposed to take. And because I was such a good rower, we would get to the end of where we were supposed to be going much quicker. So I had to learn to row very slowly. It was, <laughs> it, that was, I think he got quite cross with me on that point, actually. I mean, of course, Angela, as you know, is a great friend of Peter Vaughan's. Um, but here he was playing this incredibly sinister uh, person. And um, of course, he's not at all. Uh, but I, I, I was a little wary of him, I think, because I, I didn't know him like Angela did. And uh, because of his presence, he's got a huge presence. 
as, a, as an actor and uh, I didn't really get to know him and I really didn't get to know anybody else. My main relationship in the film is with Angela. I mean, I knew who she was because I admired her work tremendously. And my then husband knew her because I think they were at RADA. In those days, you did get rehearsal time, which was a luxury. And I do think that we did actually get to work on some of the script before we started filming. That's my memory. So I got to know her, but I was a little in awe of her. She was a bit more experienced than I was. Um, and yet I liked her very much in instinctively. And um, I admired what she was doing. I could see she had a huge amount to do in the film. I mean, it's her film, really. And I thought she was wonderful in it. I could see what she was doing. She's got a face where you can read what's going on inside. It's a marvellous thing. You, you, if you're playing a character like that, and the character I was playing, it, 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 it influences how you relate whilst you're working together. So uh, I do remember liking her very much and being a little, uh, yeah, a bit scared sometimes. Yes, I think so. But I, I think I was so young and so... Um, a little bit anxious, I suppose, about doing a good job, and you, you, actors are very introverted in that way. They're very self-involved. I think there were tensions in, in the relationship, um, I mean, I hope Angela doesn't mind me saying this, between her and Jose. And, um, and I think that was probably difficult. Uh, and I think that was just an artistic thing. And you know, he was a very, quite a sort of autocratic, um, as I say, quite direct person. And for some reason that didn't particularly bother me. But I think it can get under some people's skin and you feel as if you're being bossed about and told what to do. Or being a director is being directive. And sometimes that can be difficult for actors. I also think if you're playing a, a part like the part Angela was playing, you're affected by it. Psychologically, you don't play those parts, it gets under your skin and it's disturbing to play a disturbed person. Angela's character in particular, you're never given a, a character description of what's happened before, so you don't know her backstory as it were. Um, my understanding of it now from where I am at now is that she, there's something has happened which has been a very traumatic event and she has been traumatised. I mean, I suppose it's that thing that I often think when something terrible happens in, in life, whether a person is mad or bad, and uh, uh, in other words, the good and evil argument, when people do bad things, they're evil. I don't, th that's not the way I think. I think people do things um, which are uh, disturbed and, and wrong, but because, because they're disturbed and something really bad has happened to them. So that's what my understanding of, of, uh, of her part in the, in the film is. She acts out her fantasies and her feelings because she doesn't have the capacity that you or I might have to be able to think things through. It's to do with having a kind of fixation on something and when you're fixated on a particular belief that you have, uh, a fantasy that you have, and you don't have the capacity to be able to, to analyze what's going on you're caught in that particular behavior and you you don't you can't step back from it. you can't disidentify from the feelings so then that's why you act out what it is that you're feeling most of us have the capacity to, hopefully to be able to do that but in in the film she doesn't you know, as you know it, it it became rather a sort of big film in its in its own little way and we got to go to, it was chosen to, well, I can't remember exactly what it was, but we got to go to Cannes and, and stayed at the Carlton and it was all rather glamorous. And again, it's like now I think about how, how exciting that must have been. And I, I just remember thinking, well, the obvious things, what am I going to wear? Um, where are we going to stay? Oh, you're going to stay at the Carlton. Well, that's pretty good news. And, uh, just being it, it being a bit of a when we got there a lot of doing this sort of thing meeting people and talking and, and talking about the film and um, and not having enough time to really take in how fantastic is this how exciting is this
There was a big screening and we all got dressed up and I can remember being in the hotel room and trying to work out what I was going to wear and all that sort of thing and then rather glamorous, the red carpet and the whole thing. It was fantastic. It was really exciting and um, wanting to hide under the chair a lot of the time during the screening, of course. Um, but that's, <laughs> it, was, it was wonderful. It was very, very exciting. A lot of very um, warm warmth and positive feedback we all got and um, um, people being really interested in it and um, in the relationship between me and Angela, of course. And uh, yeah, it was, it, it was, we felt, I felt that it went down very well. I thought there was a lot of really positive energy around. Um, I just felt it was one of those experiences that had gone and disappeared. So it was a huge surprise to me to hear that it was sort of reappearing. And, um, and a great delight, I must say. Real, real joy. How, how would you rate symptoms in terms of all the other things that you've done? You know, other shows of TV films? And if, you'd, films? if you'd asked me that before we did this um, meeting, I'd have said um, I would have been a bit more blasé about it but thinking about it and revisiting it has made me realize that it was a really um, it was a real opportunity for me and 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 as I say the word that comes up is a true delight I loved doing that film and I, I absolutely loved Peter Cushing. He was the sweetest, gentlest, kindest man to me and he really looked after me and he treated me just like his daughter. I mean, that's he, 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 he sort of felt in some kind of strange way, because he was a spiritualist, that I was some sort of incarnation of, um, I don't know, his wife Helen who had died. Um,